Chapter 1 of Steam Men of the Prairies by Edward S. Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Nelson. Steam Men of the Prairies. Chapter 1 The Terror of the Prairies. "'Holy Virgin! What is that?' exclaimed Mickey McSquizzle with something like horrified amazement. "'By the jumping Jehoshaphat! Now if that don't beat all nature! It's the devil broke loose, with full steam on!' There was good cause for these exclamations upon the part of the Yankee and Irishman, as they stood on the margin of Wolf Ravine and gazed off over the prairie. Several miles to the north, Something like a gigantic man could be seen approaching, apparently at a rapid gait for a few seconds, when it slackened its speed until it scarcely moved. Occasionally it changed its course, so that it went nearly at right angles. At such times its colossal proportions were brought out in full relief, looking like some titan as it took its giant strides over the prairie. The distance was too great to scrutinize the phenomenon closely but they could see that a black volume of smoke issued either from its mouth or the top of its head, while it was drawing behind it a sort of carriage, in which a single man was seated, who appeared to control the movements of the extraordinary being in front of him. No wonder that something like superstitious have filled the breasts of the two men who had ceased hunting for gold for a few minutes to view the singular apparition, for such a thing had scarcely been dreamed of at that day, by the most imaginative philosophers, much less had it ever entered the head of these two men on the western prairies. Begora, but it's the old devil hitched to his throttin' wagon, with his old wife holdin' the reins!' exclaimed Mickey, who had scarcely removed his eyes from the singular object. "'That there critter in the wagon is a man,' said Hopkins, looking as intently in the same direction. "'It seems to me—' he added a moment later, that there's somebody else a-sittin' alongside of him, either a dog or a boy. Well, now, ain't that queer? Bagara, Bagara, do you hear that? What shall we do? At that instant, a shriek like that of some agonized giant came home to them across the plains, and both looked around as if to flee in terror. But the curiosity of the Yankee restrained him his practical eye saw that whatever it might be, it was a human contrivance, and there could be nothing supernatural about it. Look! Just after giving its ear-splitting screech, it turned straight toward the two men, and with the black smoke rapidly puffing from the top of its head, came tearing along at a tremendous rate. Mickey manifested some nervousness, but he was restrained by the coolness of Ethan, who kept his position with his eye fixed keenly upon it. Coming at such a railroad speed, it was not long in passing the intervening space. It was yet several hundred yards distant, when Ethan Hopkins gave Mickey a ringing slap on the shoulder. "'Jerusalem! Who do you suppose now that man is sitting in the carriage and holding the reins?' "'What a, what a! Why do you ask me, when I'm so frightened entirely that I don't know who I am myself?' "'It's Baldy!' "'Get out!' replied the Irishman, but added the next moment, "'Am I sleeping or dreaming? It's Baldy or his ghost!' It certainly was no ghost, judging from the manner in which it acted. For he sat with his hat cocked on one side, a pipe in his mouth and the two reins in his hands, just as the skillful driver controls the meddlesome horses and keeps them well in hand. He was seated upon a large pile of wood, while near nestled a little hump-backed, bright-eyed boy, whose eyes sparkled with delight at the performance of the strange machine. The speed of the steam man gradually slackened, until it came opposite the men, when it came to a dead halt, and the grinning Baldy, as he was called, from having lost his scalp several years before by the Indians, tipped his hat and said, "'Glad to see you hain't gone under yet. How'd you get along while I was gone?' But the men were hardly able to answer any questions yet, 
until they had learned something more about the strange creation before them. Mickey shied away, as the timid steed does at the first sight of the locomotive, observing which, the boy, at a suggestion from Baldy, gave a string in his hand a twitch, whereupon the nose of the wonderful thing threw out a jet of steam with the sharp screech of the locomotive whistle. Mickey sprung a half a dozen feet backward, and would have run off at full speed down the ravine had not Ethan Hopkins caught his arm. "'What's the matter, Mickey, now? Haven't you ever heard anything like a locomotive whistle?' "'What a water now! But is that the way the creature blows its nose? It must have a beautiful voice when it snores at night.' Perhaps at this point a description of the singular mechanism should be given. It was about ten feet in height, measuring to the top of the stove-pipe hat which was fashioned after the common order of felt coverings, with a broad brim all painted a shiny black. The face was made of iron, painted a black color with a pair of fearful eyes, and a tremendous grinning mouth. A whistle-like contrivance was made to answer for the nose. The steam-chest proper and boiler were where the chest in a human being is generally supposed to be, extending also into a large knapsack arrangement over the shoulders and back. A pair of arms, like projections, held the shafts, and the broad flat feet were covered with sharp spikes, as though he were the monarch of baseball players. The legs were quite long, and the step was natural, except when running, at which time the bolt uprightness in the figure showed different from a human being. In the knapsack were the valves, by which the steam or water was examined. In front was a painted imitation of a vest, in which a door opened to receive the fuel, which, together with the water, was carried in the wagon, a pipe running along the shaft and connecting with the boiler. The lines which the driver held controlled the course of the steam man. Thus, by pulling the strap on the right, a deflection was caused which turned it in that direction, and the same acted on the other side. A small rod, which ran along the right shaft, let out or shut off the steam, as was desired, while a cord, running along the left, controlled the whistle at the nose. The legs of this extraordinary mechanism were fully a yard apart, so as to avoid the danger of its upsetting and at the same time there was given more room for the play of the delicate machinery within. Long, sharp, spike-like projections adorned those toes of the immense feet, so that there was little danger of it slipping, while the length of the legs showed that, under favorable circumstances, the steam-man must be capable of very great speed. After Ethan Hopkins had somewhat familiarized himself with the external appearance of this piece of mechanism, he ventured upon a more critical examination. The door being opened in front showed a mass of glowing coals lying in the capacious abdomen of the giant, the hissing valves in the knapsack made themselves apparent, and the top of the hat, or smokestack, had a sieve-like arrangement, such as is frequently seen on the locomotive. There were other little conveniences in the way of creating a draft, and of shutting it off when too great, which could scarcely be understood without a scrutiny of the figure itself. The steam-man was a frightful-looking object, being painted of a glossy black, with a pair of white stripes down its legs, and with a face which was intended to be of a flesh-color, but which was really a fearful red. To give the machinery an abundance of room, the steam-man was exceedingly corpulent, swelling out to aldermanic proportions, which, after all, was little out of harmony with its immense height. The wagon dragged behind was an ordinary four-wheeled vehicle, with springs and very strong wheels, a framework being arranged so that, when necessary, it could be securely covered. To guard against the danger of upsetting, it was very broad, with low wheels, which, it may be safely said, were made to hum when the gentleman got fairly under way. Such is a brief and imperfect description of this wonderful steam-man, as it appeared on its first visit to the western prairies. End of chapter 1